What a pleasure it is to be here today, here in Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, to interview Robin Hanbury Tennyson, one of the greatest explorers of the last 50, 60 years. And it's a particular pleasure to speak to him today because he hasn't long survived uh, COVID. He very nearly became one of the first casualties of COVID during the pandemic. So a real treat to have some time to spend with him today. It never occurred to me that I was really going to die, even though I was told by the consultant that if I was taken to A&E, I had a 20% chance of survival. If I stayed where I was, I had a nil chance of survival. By the time I was halfway through the five weeks in a coma, they were telling Luella and Merlin to prepare for the worst because I had a less than 5% chance of survival. Can you just for hearing Merlin's voice? I believe I'm alive. You are alive. You are alive. You're definitely Don't alive. You My name is Robin Hemper Tennyson. I'm an 84 year old explorer and I survived five weeks in intensive care with coronavirus. I've been an explorer all my life and over the last 60 plus years, I've traveled in most of the rainforests and deserts of the world and visited over a hundred different tribes and started the whole rainforest movement by leading a major scientific expedition in Borneo, the 130 scientists who worked out why rainforests really matter. The team at Derriford were flawless and we can't thank them or, or be prouder of them. Um, for five weeks my father was sedated, coronavirus was too severe, he had multiple organ failure, he was on full ventilation, full dialysis and had secondary infections and we were told we weren't going to be able to come and say goodbye but to make our peace with it um, because he was going to die. The moment when I actually woke up and knew that I was going to live was the moment when I was wheeled out by four nurses in a big bed uh, with tubes coming out of everywhere and I arrived in the healing garden they've got at Derriford, I think the first in any hospital in England. And uh, I opened my eyes, saw the sunshine, saw the flowers, and that was the moment when my life was saved by the healing power of nature. A lot of people asked me when I miraculously survived against all the odds, uh, what my next challenge was going to be. And obviously the first one was to get walking again because when I came out I could barely do 10 yards on my Zimmer frame. My wife Luella has been marvellous at encouraging me to do my exercises and now that I'm pretty well done the physio, uh, we're concentrating on walking longer distance every day. Well exactly five months from May the 3rd is October the 3rd, yeah. so I decided that on that day I would climb Cornwall's highest mountain, Brown Willie, and try and raise £100,000 towards a garden at Trelisk, Cornwall's hospital, because I think every hospital in the country should have a healing garden in it. And uh, let's start with Cornwall. We have you listed as one of the greatest explorers of the last of, of my lifetime, certainly, and uh, and of course a Mungo Park medalist of Varus GS from a number of years ago. But for a man who's not long uh, recovered from COVID, I do feel you seem more full of life than ever. Is this is this a coincidence? Well, there's nothing like nearly dying for giving you a sense of purpose in life. <laughs> the bit you've got left. No, I'm incredibly lucky. I am slightly improved by the whole experience, if that's possible. Um, because I was, uh, I was very ill and I should have lots of long COVID and I haven't. And thanks to all the wonderful physio girls who contorted me into all sorts of positions after I came out of hospital, I can actually put my socks on better than I could before I went down with COVID. So I'm slightly, I like to think I'm even slightly improved by the whole experience. I think you're making light of the fact that you genuinely nearly died um, of yeah. COVID. Um, so, I mean, can you just talk about your recovery a little bit? Well, I was one of the first people to go down with it. I published this book, my new book, Taming the Four Horsemen, in February 2020. 
And on the cover I have pandemic, and on page four I say, rather cheekily, that I forecast there is about to be a massive global pandemic. It's not a question of uh, if, it's, it's just when it's going to happen. And blow me, a month later, I'm the first person really to go down badly with COVID, be given up for dead three times, to be told that I would suffer from severe um, mental problems if I did survive, which the jury is still out on that one. <laughs> and uh, I uh, was in a coma for five weeks. They couldn't get me out of it. And they eventually woke me from my coma by wheeling me out into the then only healing garden attached to an intensive care unit. And I woke up, I felt the sun on my face, I smelt the flowers, and I woke up and through my tracheostomy tube, which I had like every other thing that I had sticking out of me, I croaked, I'm going to live. And that was recorded on film, luckily. It was a clear manifestation of what is now quite a popular subject, which is the healing power of nature, because it actually brought me round. And so, weak as a kitten when I came out from hospital on my Zimmer frame and could go about one yard at a time, I said, well, I'm going to raise 100,000 or more so that Cornwall has a healing garden attached to its intensive care unit. And we've done that, and it's underway, and it's all going to happen. So another good outcome of catching COVID. It's not all bad. Yes, well, fantastic. You've turned it into something very special. So uh, When we met in, in Glasgow, you said, um, at, at COP, you said that um, the last two or three years have been fantastic, apart from the the couple of months you spent in a coma. <laughs> what has been so fantastic Well, they've about been the extraordinary. For one thing, because I was, um, took quite a long time to recover from all this, I've uh, been able to do a great deal of reading, much more than normal. I mean, literally a book a day sometimes. And there have been so many extraordinarily interesting books published in the last three years about the environment, about climate change, about the wood wide web and the whole awareness that is suddenly growing and being accepted by everybody, that climate change is real, that nature is fantastic and little understood, that trees do talk to each other through endless thousands of yards of filaments. And this is so exciting and so interesting and so much in accordance with what I'd been writing about before and really putting forward as tentative ideas which are now all coming to fulfilment. So I'm hard at work on my next book. Um, telling everyone I told you so. This is all now happening. <laughs> and how exciting it is that we are discovering what an amazing planet we're on. I mean, I think you must be aware, Mike, that the, the, the attitude towards the environment has changed radically over the last two or three years. Partly that's due, what I call the silver cloud of, uh, silver lining of, uh, of COVID, is that people have become much more aware of the, their surroundings and being able to listen to birds and smell the fresh air but also because there just have been so many really interesting books written about all this. And it's now becoming all sorts of rather wacky ideas about Japanese uh, forest bathing and Shinrin Yoko are now becoming mainstream science. Um, they're even looking into um, the power of uh, psychedelic drugs again as being a respectable way of treating various ailments and therapies. So we are going through an extraordinary revolution an intellectual revolution, recognising the richness of this planet of ours, and I'm enjoying that so much. Fantastic. And, and, and actually that's interesting because it plays to some of your interest in all of the sort of indigenous knowledge and indigenous voices and things that you obviously have so much direct experience of. So, I mean, you were at COP with uh, a lot of indigenous leaders. Actually, the photo you took at COP, of the, the rainbow of a Hope Street is, yeah. uh, is my staff's well, favourite photo it, of COP. COP. COP 26 was an extraordinary experience. I was lucky enough to be appointed an observer, so I was inside the, uh, uh, the Blue Zone, the Sanctum, Holy Sanctum, where all sorts of important plenary sessions were going on and people were discussing all this. But what was noticeable about it for me was that for the first time, one of the four criteria for COP was the involvement of indigenous people and their knowledge. And so as a result, even inside the uh, blue zone, if you looked over the crowds, you would see feather headdresses popping up all over the place. And in all the uh, beating rooms and things that were going on, there were always indigenous people there. And they were being respected and taken seriously. Their knowledge 
was, was recognized by everybody from government ministers and presidents down to be a substantial contribution to the debate on what was happening with climate change. Um, indigenous wisdom is now recognized as part of the debate. That's a pretty exciting thing for me, who seen f over 50 years ago when we started Survival International, that it was regarded as a very fringe idea that indigenous people should know anything. Now they are mainstream. That was enormously exciting. And so did you see that as a very positive uh, cop then in general, or how did you sort well, of perceive Well, I've written a little bit about it since about what I call the tangible dissonance between the positivity within the blue zone and, and the green zone, where, all right, there was masses of greenwashing, there was masses of hypocrisy, and one takes it all with a huge pinch of salt. But governments and multinational companies and all the baddies, all the people we've been blaming for all this, were actually saying the right things and were talking to each other about treaties and about little tiny baby steps towards solving the problem. Of course it's not nearly enough, but it's something. And of course it was brought about by Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion and everybody kicking capitalism hard in the backside and telling them to got to do something about it. And they are doing something about it. Not enough, but they are doing something. So the dissonance that I felt was very tangible at COP was between what was actually going on inside the conference and the protesters outside, who I joined on the big march when we went in pouring rain through Glasgow, uh, protesting and having a wonderful time and singing and, and, and shouting and chanting, uh, which was all very good, but also very negative. They were not giving any credit to what was happening. And I kept wanting to say, well, what do you expect? You know, you've, you've started a thing, encourage them. Give them a little bit of encouragement. Give the governments and the multinationals and all the baddies just a little help to find some solutions. Don't trash everything as greenwashing, because it isn't all. There, are, there is, a, I believe, a global belief in uh, the need to do something about climate change. And I regard that as a positive step and I think it's time we all started working together to bring that about, rather than just continuing to attack everybody all the time. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree there's a danger that we get into this phase where nothing's good enough, and if yeah. nothing's good enough, well, why try? So yes, exactly. we do need and to you can't trust that. any politicians, and, you, and everything is cynical, and all business is bad, and uh, all companies, corporates, uh, is just interested in the bottom line. They're not. When, when a, the head of a, a corporation sees themselves exposed on the front page of the Sunday Times as the biggest polluter in country, and he's sitting at the breakfast table with his children saying, Daddy, are you really the worst polluter in the country? I think that is beginning to make people sit up and think, well, maybe my company had better do something. And that's the way change is going to come about, uh, not yes. by revolution, because revolution is always painful, mostly for the, the least privileged people. Indeed. I want to, I can't sit here and talk to you and not talk about your expeditions. Um, there's been too many of them to ignore and uh, mm. it's such a big part of, uh, of what you've done. So I, I sort of, you've done expeditions that are more adventure. Um, I think you once described that as showing off with a purpose. Yep. Um, but in that case, you've obviously shown off quite a lot in some areas, but uh, particularly just racking your brain, some of the hovercraft trips to it was Lake Chad yeah. and Trinidad. I mean, these are a long time ago now, but... Well, the first hovercraft expedition, which was from the Amazon to from Manaus to Trinidad over the Orinoco and the Casiquiare, was an extraordinary feat of engineering. And we missed a trick there because that could have provided an alternative method of opening up the interior of Brazil by using the natural communication systems, which are the rivers, without much damage. Instead of which, this was all in the late 60s, and it nearly happened. And if Britain had been a bit better at our salesmanship, which has never been our strong cue, uh, we could have uh, um, sold lots of hovercraft and, and developed a network of, of the existing settlements were all on the rivers, and they could have worked that way, instead of which, turned out there was more money to be made by bulldozing 
roads through the Amazon rainforest, which has been catastrophic. It's half the size it was when I first crossed it in 1958. Half the size, the biggest rainforest in the world. Half of it's gone in my relatively brief lifetime. And that's appalling. So the Hovercraft expedition, which was an interesting experience, um, with scientists studying various things, river patterns and, and so on, um, was a contribution to it all. And that's what I believe expeditions should be. They should be changing the world by understanding it better. That's the purpose of exploration. Yeah, very powerful. Um, I Just recounting, I, I had um, Davi Yanomami, who um, yes. uh, you will know, um, visit. Um, and he knew that Scotland used to be mostly wooded. And I took him to an indigenous woodland because I wanted him to Caledonia relax and, yeah. and, and enjoy the woodland and treat it in a way that he would be more used to. Did you? And um, we had this sort of very poignant moment when uh, he got out of the car and said, this isn't a woodland, I can see the other side. Yes. And he, he saw a future of the Amazon in, in that, yeah. that uh, view. How interesting. Yes. So, well, he's a magical man, Davi. I mean, a, a proper shaman and uh, a great man. And you've met him many times, yes. no, so yes, yes. yeah. And that, so that is interesting too, because a lot of the expeditions you've run have been sort of very insightful into the way that different people live and the different, you know, perspectives that they bring. I'm thinking, you, I mean, you've lived with so many different tribes, but the Tuareg, for instance. Um, well, I, I've been very lucky in, in living an explorer's life during a sort of Goldilocks era when you had the best of both worlds. I mean, the, the great explorers, the great Victorian explorers, took months, years sometimes, to get to where they were going to be and then had to spend years hacking and hewing their way slowly through the environment and, and leading very, very uncomfortable lives for years at a time, which ruined their domestic life and so on, um, in order to do their thing. And then there was a fairly brief period, really since the Second World War, when one was able to fly anywhere in next to no time without feeling guilty about it and spend so it went straight from London into the centre of the Sahara or the centre of Amazonas, did your thing, travelled, went straight onto a camel or a dugout canoe or whatever, um, did your exploring and then was able to come straight back out of it again, as I say again, without feeling guilty. Sadly, now, with our awareness of our carbon footprint, um, that Goldilocks era has passed and when young people say I want to go and do what you did and it's not fair that you say I shouldn't because of, uh, of your carbon footprint but I'm afraid that is going to be the situation until we have uh, electric aeroplanes which won't be long I'm a great optimist I think before long we'll be acceptable to fly again because they're, they're working on it short haul flights can already be done by uh, renewable energy so but I, I've been very lucky to have been able to explore during that period. Yes, yeah. And, and you've spent time with some very interesting groups. And, and that meant that one could get this wonderful culture shock, which I think is a, is a great stimulus uh, to be able to move from the sophistication of my London club, for example, uh, within 24 hours to being with indigenous people in a totally different environment, with a totally different cosmos, a view of the world, and, and to be able to make that switch and be the same person um, deep down and yet communicating with totally different people about on a, on a, on a different wavelength. And that's very interesting and, and, and I found it enormously stimulating to be able to do that. I just love being able to literally within, within 24 hours go from Mayfair to being on a camel in the heart of the Sahara without anybody else for hundreds of miles and, and, and being travelling with the Tuareg as a Tuareg. And I think that gives one a slightly different insight to what life's all about. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, assuming we can sort out the travel problem, and it seems uh, I, I, it's important that young people do take these journeys and do experience that culture shock, isn't it? It is. but. Now they have a, a, a slightly bigger hill to climb to justify their existence. As you were saying, my original explorations were pure showing off. I just <laughs> thought it was a good thing to go and do that because nobody had done it before. And one got brownie points for, 
for being the first and doing all that, which I now regard as as, as pretty uh, spurious. But uh, today, to justify your existence in doing these things, you have to be doing serious scientific research to um, understand the planet better and understand how nature works and symbiotic relationships and so on. And these are the real explorers of today, are the people who are justifiably there because they're uh, discovering what an exciting and diverse planet we live on. And that's perfectly acceptable. But uh, doing it just because nobody's done it before isn't anymore. Yeah, doesn't really have the same sort of cachet. So. A, a lot of the trips you've taken have been on horseback. Now, I know from speaking to you earlier, you don't particularly view that as exploration, but um, is that your sort of preferred... Well, that, that was something Luella and I, when we um, first got married 35-odd um, years ago, um, we decided to bring some more horses to the farm in Cornwall from the south of France, and we rode across France. And it was meant to be a sort of magical honeymoon riding through autumnal France. But the BBC wanted to make a film about it, my publishers wanted a book, and we decided um, that we'd therefore better have backup and do it properly. And uh, as a result, had the most wonderful time being um, having camp set up every evening uh, and just riding through wonderful wild country, which is the best way to see a country and write a book about it because you're riding, you're sitting on an intelligent animal which is doing all the work. You can hold hands and communicate and listen to the birds and watch the countryside going past and write lots about it and it's a great way of writing a book so I did we did eight of those in different parts of the world including riding the links of the Great Wall of China across New Zealand Spain Albania Britain and um, it was a it, but that I don't regard as exploration that's uh, travel travel in the best possible way on a horse yes and the speed of it just allows you to yes properly see a place I see that and um, I've always had a sense that you you've got a particular um, soft spot for uh, Borneo, Brazil, um, and I know you were saying earlier the Sahara as well, but particularly sort of Borneo and Brazil. Um, and I wondered, I was actually, and you're a great reader as well, I was reading Aldo Leopold's um, Think Like a Mountain recently, in which he said that he didn't like going back to places because he didn't like to see the change that had uh, undergone. But you've got so many friends in these places, so you well, must have seen I get that. quite significant changes. And it is depressing to go back and see the changes. I mean, deeply depressing in Amazonas, where one flew for hours and hours on a little light aircraft in the old days over impenetrable forest, huge, richest environment on Earth, like a great cabbage patch, to stretching from horizon to horizon. Now, I did it a couple of years ago, uh, you see these straight lines with desert on one side, rainforest on the other and the desert is encroaching all the time into those areas. And in Brazil it's even worse, in Borneo, Sarawak, where I spent lots of time since I was first there in 1958, um, when it was 95% covered in forest, and there were just little longhouses, you saw occasional little enclaves in the forest. Today, 5% is left of the lowland forest, and everywhere else the, 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 the countryside is just riddled with um, bulldozed paths and uh, palm oil and it is very depressing to see huge environments destroyed and of course with a terrible effect on that, both the environment and the wildlife and the people and um, that has been my preoccupation really of my life is trying to slow that up very ineffectively I may say I mean trying to stop the corruption that goes behind um, tropical forest logging and behind the degradation of, of the people has been very difficult uphill battle and we thought we were getting somewhere um, we got a long way with Brazil the, the very strong indigenous movements who um, we were welcoming to see them doing the uh, the work that we started trying to do in the late 60s and um, everything was looking pretty good up until three or four years ago when Bolsonaro came in and it's now almost as bad as it was at the beginning when things looked very very bleak and they do again but the battle goes on. I mean, I remember in Borneo, I was out in Borneo for a number of months, some years back. Mm. Um, and one of the things that struck me was 
not just the, the corruption, but a lack of understanding by the Malaysian authorities mm. about the number of people that even lived in the forest. There was almost a sort of denial about the, how many people could possibly survive in, the, in that sort of way. That's a very familiar picture all over. You get the same thing in both Borneo and again in Brazil, where one of the great arguments for opening up the rainforest and cutting it down was that it was quite wrong that such a large area should be owned by such few people. But to give them credit, in Brazil, they have one of the largest proportions of the country uh, protected for the indigenous population than anywhere else. And remarkably, those are the areas that still are uh, pristine and have been protected. And uh, uh, whereas, and unfortunately, the, the same philosophy did not apply in Borneo, where the people's rights to their land was not recognized in the same way. And there's a kind of anomaly there that one is always trying to expose. Why don't you recognize that um, the Bumiputra, the real indigenous people of the country, are actually entitled to manage the land in their own way? And if they don't want it logged, then it shouldn't be done over their heads, but it has been. And I'm involved in a big law case at the moment in, in, in Sarawak, where one of the last remaining bits of rainforest just outside the national park I spent so much time in is about to be logged and turned into a palm oil plantation. And I think we're going to win that case. And maybe, maybe the worm is turning. Look, too little, too late, but at least it's something. Yes. Well, that, I mean, that's sort of strong because you've been involved in this for so long. Mm. I mean, I appreciate um, you not able to stand up and say that you've <laughs> you single-handedly saved the rainforest, but you've yeah. seen some success. I've been part of it. I'm very proud to have been part of the campaign all yes. these years. And you were obviously the founder of Survival International some years yeah. back. One so, of, One of the founders. One of the founders. So that came from your direct experience in Absolutely. forest regions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, even from uh, seeing the effect that uh, uh, contact, um, uninformed contact with tribal people was having on their societies and seeing how destructive it was. And so... I mean, within survival, I mean, not everybody will know about survival, because, well, can you just tell us a little bit about what that's done, what sort of things you're most proud of? Well, in 1968, in fact, on the Hovercraft expedition, funnily enough, um, I was talking to a remarkable man, an ethnobotanist called Conrad Gorinsky, and he'd grown up um, with, with the Rupununi tribes. And uh, we were saying, because there was a huge scandal at that time when... A judicial review had exposed that a tribe a year was dying out in Brazil and that it was largely down to the indigenous organization, the Indian Protection Service, which used to be a model of its kind but had become totally corrupted and they were deliberately killing off tribes by infecting them with smallpox and raping, murdering and killing them and bombing them and doing all sorts of terrible things. And this expose had just come out and we were saying, do you realize there's no international organization that represents people who have no other voice in the world, tribal people all over the world, who are the world's largest minority? I mean, there's uh, you know, 400 million tribal people in, in different parts of the world. And, um, and there's no voice for them. There's voices for, what? for animals, there's the World Wildlife Fund, there's voice for political prisoners, there's Amnesty International. This is back in the 60s. And there was no voice for tribal people. So we decided there ought to be such a, an organization. And shortly after we got back, Norman Lewis, a great writer, um, published the biggest colour supplement there's ever been, the Sunday Times colour supplement with the headline, Genocide, about this whole scandal that was going on in Brazil. And the next thing we knew, everybody was meeting in my flat and uh, uh, discussing how there ought to be such an organisation. And that's where survival grew from. Fantastic. And it's obviously gone on to become well, it's now, still a, a modest but still... Successful significant influence it's had on, on, on people all over the world. I think I, my, I always say that I think the proudest thing that survival has done is that there's probably not a primary school or secondary school anywhere in the world that hasn't got a picture of a South American Indian or some indigenous person on the wall uh, recognizing their contribution that indigenous knowledge has. And just changing perspective, perception, of, uh, of tribal peoples, of indigenous knowledge, 
has pervaded right through, right up to COP26, where it was one of the four criteria for trying to save the world. That I regard as our greatest achievement. And that's a huge legacy, really, for mm. groups of people that are often dehumanised. And have world. been in the past, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not anymore. Well, that's a wonderful achievement. Is, within all of that, I mean, obviously your experience of various Indigenous groups is, is huge. So is there a sort of perspective that you've picked up that, or, or a sort of ideas that you've seen or stumbled across that you sort of think should be, everybody should know about? Well, it's very simple, really. And it, what is exciting is that it's now mainstream, a respect for nature, animism. Animism is the only really true religion that works. I mean, other monotheistic religions have tried to codify our behaviour into ways that are going to please or displease somebody sitting on a white cloud up there, which we know is pretty good rubbish. That's not how it works. Um, I'm, I'm all for laws and, and ways of behaviour. I mean, I grew up in, in, in an Anglican or Church of Ireland, uh, which has perfectly good rules to live by, and that's fine. But you don't have to believe that because you're a Catholic and I'm a Protestant or vice versa, one of you is going to rot in eternal damnation. I mean, that's obviously rubbish. Whereas most of the world still really believes in animism, in the old religions, in the power of nature, in respecting, you know, you can diminish it by saying they're worshipping trees and rocks and things. They are not. You're worshipping the integrity of those elements of nature, which we're all part of. And I believe that it's time we had another intellectual revolution, and it's happening with the whole green movement, in, in beginning to recognise nature as God. But that's what I'm writing about at the moment, and I'm very excited about it. And I got those ideas and, and, and became imbued with this belief by living for short and long times with a huge variety of different tribal people, all of whom respect nature in the way that everybody is telling us we should be doing now. So sort of a natural enlightenment and sense of place. Yes. Way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, talking about place then, just bringing it slightly closer to home, I sense that some of your later trips were, and, and maybe it is more your sort of, um, to write books and things, but a number of your journeys were within Europe and a bit closer to home. Um, one of which I think was Albania. You were, You took a that was our last three. ride, our last long ride. Right. Okay. Simply because I'd never been to Albania. It was one of the, practically the only European country I hadn't visited. <laughs> and it turned out to be one of the most interesting countries you can imagine. It's a very good book I wrote on that one. And so can you tell us a little bit about Ever Albania since, then and why people well, should... Well, uh, it all became popular in the British imagination by Lord Byron writing uh, Child Harold while riding through Albania. So we were following in his footsteps. No, it's a, it's a great yarn, but that's not exploration, that, that, that's just fun. That's just fun. Seeing, right, seeing countries and writing about them is, is good fun. So bringing it right close to home then, here we are at uh, Kibbeled. You've got a farm here that you've been on this land for a long time, but also a sense um, that you've not always, you know, in the same way that you've explored and pushed boundaries, a sense that you've farmed at the edges as well. You've tried lots of different ways of of making the farm turn over and make money? When I bought the farm in 1960, I bought it lock, stock and barrel. There were eight employees, eight families were living off this very poor hill farm at Bobbin Moor, 350 odd acres, and it provided a living for eight people. Those were the days of mixed farming. We did all sorts of stuff. Uh, by the time I had followed the guidelines of the common agricultural policy and intensified and tried all sorts of different things. Uh, red deer and wild boar and goodness knows what. Um, we were down to one man. And uh, now I've handed the farm over to my son. And he, being much more intelligent than me, has looked at how you could possibly make a living out of a hill farm and possibly once again employ more than eight people on it, which it seems beyond the bounds of possibility to my generation. But he's done it, and he's turned the place into a retreat for people wanting to escape from the pressures of modern life and do yoga and meditation and, and so on. And amazingly, serendipitously, we have found that the one bit of the farm that I never tried to farm on, because it was a rough piece of useless 80 acres of rocky woodland, 
turns out to be one of the rarest environments on Earth, temperate rainforest, northern temperate rainforest, which is incredibly rich biologically, uh, full of ancient oak trees, 6,000-year-old undisturbed woodland, which is now being examined by scientists as part of this whole therapy business to see how beneficial just going and being in a woodland, ancient woodland, can be for health. And suddenly, amazingly, that is now all mainstream science and is being recognised as what we should all be doing, not just for benefit of climate change and for um, improving the diversity of the, of, of the wildlife of our country, but also improving our health. And so the two are coming together, and good luck to him. It's working. And they've been voted um, by Times, Telegraph, Guardian as one of the top uh, ten or even four, I think, uh, therapy centres in the country after only one year. They're into their second year now. So it's enormously exciting for me as proud father to look and see what he's doing with a farm that I never managed to make any money out of <laughs> as a conventional farmer. And um, ironic that you've travelled several times around the world looking at rainforest and here you have one on your doorstep. Again, a piece of serendipity that there I've been on rain, tropical rainforests and actually temperate rainforests are, are as rich and much, much rarer than tropical rainforests. And it's all happening here on the farm. Fantastic. You couldn't make it up. Can you tell me just briefly also about, um, is it Claude Van Damme and Sigourney Beaver? Well, part of the whole uh, rewilding, and we don't call it rewilding anymore, because although there's a lot to be said for that, it's regenerative farming is what he's doing here. But part of it is all trying to restore the original biodiversity of this country. And that may involve bringing back species that have become extinct. Well, 400 years ago, we wiped out the last beavers here. And we have reintroduced beavers. We have an enclosure, and we've got two there, called Sigourney Beaver and Jean-Claude Van Damme, with their two kids. And um, they already, in the year and a half that they've been there, have transformed their small enclosed area, because they're not released yet, um, transformed it beyond recognition in just that short time. They built dams, which now have four foot deep water in them, whereas before there was just a little trickle of water going down with tiny little fish, perhaps, if you were lucky. Now there are dams with quite big fish in them, trout, um, that grow in there. They're vegetarian, of course, so they're, they're not eating the fish, but they're creating a habitat for them. And water voles and insects and everything is booming as a result of the activity of beavers. Just one of the things we're doing. There's lots more planned in the future. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Another of your strands, obviously, you've written a lot of books over the years. Your last one was uh, The Taming the Four Horsemen. Um, you've mentioned, of course, the first of those, which was the, you know, um, pandemic and pestilence, and we've slightly touched on that already. The, the second was war, um, and I think you linked war with um, renewable energy and uh, avoiding fossil fuels and things, so that... Is that another one of your told-me-so moments? Or? Well, Ukraine has slightly thrown that one sideways because that was not caused by what, when I was writing the book, were the causes of wars, which tended to be desertification, and they were in hot places and where uh, poverty was tended to be the cause of war. And I was saying that the solution to that is to have renewable energy for all so that everybody has the, is, is liberated by having access to the Internet. And in fact, I mean, travelling in remote places, you see, I was in Burma just two and a half years ago, just before Covid happened, uh, way up a river, and there I saw a little thatched house with a solar panel on it. And I asked the chap who was sitting outside, what's your solar panel for? And he said, to charge my mobile phone, of course. Duh. I mean, think about that. Think through what that means. It meant that he instantly, in one of the remotest places in the world, had access to the entire internet. He could leapfrog the entire industrial revolution, didn't have to have internal combustion engines. He could learn and, and be liberated. And if he had, for example, also a solar-powered stove and a solar-powered water pump, uh, he could escape most of the drudgery that is involved in uh, basic living. And so I'm very optimistic that, that a revolution of that sort can come about. And that might just stop wars. 
Yes, well, it would be nice if it would stop the Ukraine war, wouldn't it? But uh, the, the, the last um, two that you identify are around famine and death. You link to geoengineering, um, which is obviously itself quite a controversial yes. idea. So can you tell us a bit more about Well, once again, I'm an eternal optimist, and I believe that uh, we have got... I mean, what, what else? Have, we haven't got a lot going for us as a human race. We've, we've screwed up most of what we've done to the planet. But one thing we have got is the biggest brain that the universe has ever produced, as far as we know. I mean, the human brain is something quite extraordinary. We're capable of inventing all sorts of stuff. Uh, we would usually get it wrong. But if we applied our brain to doing it, getting it right, then the sky's the limit of what we could invent. And one of the things that I think it's time to grasp the nettle, open the Pandora's box, and do, is to start controlling the weather. Everybody hates the idea of doing that because they imagine or the downside of it. But just imagine if you could control the weather in a favourable way and you could have safe harvests. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the Sahara Desert and I've seen that after five years of drought, one rainstorm, suddenly the desert blooms. Now, if you could make it rain an inch every year, an inch or two, at the appropriate time every year, suddenly people living in the most hostile and, and inhospitable parts of the world would suddenly not need to... Uh, have masses of children because most of them are going to die, which might solve the population problem, possibly, controversial. But they would also um, be liberated from the need to migrate because they'd be able to live happily in their own countries. And it might avoid, it certainly would avoid a lot of the famines that are happening all over the world. So that's another of my little controversial things I threw out. Not everybody likes it, but uh, I think we've got to think widely about the possibilities of what might happen. And geoengineering is full of wacky, mad ideas, like putting great disks into space to reflect the set power back. But I do think the idea of carbon capture and storage, where we've been grabbing all these fossil fuels out of the Earth for so long, there's a lot of space down there, why not put it back in? And we can do that now. It sounds crazy, but we are able now to sequester carbon. It's not economic yet, but it should be. And it makes a lot more sense than sending rockets off into space to have settlements on Mars, which is the last thing I think we should be doing, giving up on this planet, which is the most Which is the only one we definitely know works. <laughs> well, it's crazy. I mean, this, this planet in its best, and I've been lucky to travel in some of the most beautiful parts of it and the most wild and Garden of Eden. It is a Garden of Eden. And, and why... A, why mess it up? And B, when you've messed it up, why try and run away somewhere else? Why not try and restore it? Which is not that difficult to do. Well, if only that were the case. So I hope you're right. Um, you've obviously met several lifetimes of different people. Um, are there one or two who've particularly left an impression on you or one or two that uh, have really taught you things that you think are, have lasted? Well, uh, Jim Lovelock, founder of Gaia, who's just written his nth book, at The Age of 102, gives us all a bit of encouragement and hope. I'm a great <laughs> admirer of his. I think his sideways view of how the planet works as a single organism, uh, the whole Gaia hypothesis, um, I think resonates a lot with what we're all talking about now, with trying to save the planet. And uh, otherwise I've learned, I hope, a certain amount from living with wonderful people in the rainforest, like my great friend Nyapun, Panan hunter-gatherer, who I spent a lot of time with in the forest and have been back to see several times. He's just died. But their innate wisdom and understanding and empathy with nature is something we could all learn from. And you're, am I right, thinking you're putting a book together around that at the moment as well? So. I'm writing a book, a novel about his life. Excellent. OK, well, we'll look forward to that. Um, I came across um, a, a quote online that I think your son Marilyn had put out, actually, which was a Bismarck quote saying that only a fool learns from his own mistakes. A wise man <laughs> learns from the mistakes of others. I feel that actually that sort of defines quite a lot of what you're trying to do with the indigenous language and your, your, yes. all your indigenous connections. We all make so many mistakes and it is good to see a completely other interpretation of how the world works to realize that the, the rules and laws of nature that we were brought up to observe are not the only ones and there's another whole 
way of viewing the world and we should listen to that. Last couple of quick questions, I think. So first, um, advice for young explorers? I mean, what um, if there's younger people wanting to get started and seeing the world and learning about it more closely? I get asked this a lot. Um, have a purpose. Grow up. Get out. Grow out of thinking that just being tough is an end in itself. Uh, it's not, really. It may demonstrate the limits to which the human body can go and that may have some use in it but mostly respect nature and try to understand what a complex and wonderful planet we live on that's the purpose of exploration today and my last question then is sort of along that lines it's that idea that i think we all understand the principle that we should hand over the earth in better form than we inherited it um, and I think by many measures we're probably struggling a bit with that. Um, are we doing enough as, and what, it, what would you particularly want to hand over? What do you want people to, to wake up to? Is it that connection with nature and that? I think the most exciting thing that's happened in the last literally a couple of years, few years, has been that there has been a manifest awakening among the young to what a bloody mess we, our generation has made of the planet and they're very angry and I think that's right and good and I think that the only hope for the planet is that the young remain furious about what we've done <laughs> hold our feet to the fire and make us do better and that was what we saw at COP26 was I think the beginning of that process and let's hope they make enough noise and uh, kick enough backsides and, to make it happen during our lifetime. And quickly enough, I guess. Then. And quickly enough. Yes. Okay. Because time is running out. Indeed. Robin, thank you. Really, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Thank you so much. It.